Well, good afternoon. Uh, we are ready to start our second day of the presentation. That's the end of it. And uh, you can see the map of Nigeria up here. I told you most of you about that last week. And uh, this is the, the Kano International Airport. And this is Kaduna, where the, um, the office was. And then here's Abuja, you're going to hear about that. And Bita is over here. Uh, and I'm going to tell you about some more parts of the country. Um, all right, I would like to just go back and uh, tell you a little bit about what, how the last one ended so that you can see why I jumped ahead about six or seven months. But in January 15, 1966, the coup took place. And this is when the army took over the government and uh, they killed all the political leaders. And the one that was the most significant was Amadou Bello, who was like the Pope and Queen Elizabeth in one person. And it made the Muslims very angry. So it was a horrible mistake. They didn't think it through. And then we jumped ahead to September 30th, and 1966. And this is my daughter, Lee, going off to Beirut to school. She went to the American Community School in Beirut, which at that time was known as the Paris of the East. So it was a very beautiful city. And uh, then on October 1st, that was the next day after we took her to uh, the airport, uh, and we were on our way back to Kaduna to stay there for a couple of days and shop and things, and uh, that's when the massacre of the Eagle took place. They moved into everywhere, including the airport, the stores, the post offices, everywhere. They, and they would live, uh, they worked everywhere because they were educated by the missionaries. And they were, you know, they were able to hold those jobs. And they just murdered them all, everyone they could catch. So we had to wait in Vida for I don't remember how many days it was, and we certainly didn't go out and take any pictures. Uh, we got caught in a couple of uh, police, when the police were using tear gas, but that was it. And um, the government really wanted the people to calm down. They didn't want all this killing taking place. So um, there was outstanding acts of bravery. And uh, one of them was our friend uh, when we got back to Vida. And uh, he was an Australian. So he was still there because of the British. And he um, took all the Ebos, because Vida was a little bit late in acting, he took all the Ebos and put them on a small island. And he stood in the, on the bridge with a pistol. That's all he had. There were no guns in Nigeria at that time. You never saw anybody with guns. Only once in a while, the um, army. And so he stood there and he said, you're gonna have to kill me to get them. Mm -hmm. And they had spears, machetes, uh, everything, you know, clubs, and they just waited it out. And um, he saved them. And then he hired trucks, and he took a list of all the people, all the Igbos, and he took, chose men that he knew well and trusted, and he had them um, drive them back to the east to Biafra, what became Biafra. And he had them check off all the names that were there, and then they brought them back to him, and he saw through it that they were all saved. Um, now, I want you to go back to January 1966 here, and this is when Id al Fadir takes place. And this is uh, the Muslims uh, do a 40 a day fast where they absolutely drink no water, no nothing, and eat from sunup to sundown. And believe me, in that heat, uh, they are just in dire straits by evening. 
And at the end of that, they had this big celebration. And in Nigeria, it was called Ida El Qadir. It isn't called exactly the same thing in every part of the world. And you can see here the, uh, well, here we were invited. That's me, and that's Lee, and that's our son Tom, and Michael's back there. Mary must be in here somewhere, and she is the youngest. Uh, she was probably watched by her babysitter. And that's the emir under that big umbrella. Now the emir means he's king. He was king of that whole area, and that was all his retinue. They're always dressed the best and everything, and he has a lot of power. And then these are the famous horsemen. They were absolutely gorgeous horsemen. I mean, the way they rode it was just something to see. And there were, at this celebration, there was bands and dancers and all this, but they didn't overdo that. It was more on the horses. And when we were put in the stand, there were probably 30 or 40 people in the stands. And then the horsemen would do all these prancing around and everything. And then they'd go way out and way back. And they'd race right towards us as fast as they could go. And then they, right in front of us, they'd rear up on the horse's back legs and turn and come around and do it again. And it was very exciting. <laughs> all right, now, uh, Grandma came. Um, Earl's father came to visit us, and we met him in Kano, and then we went home first, but then we took him on a trip. And uh, when he got to our house, he's, or when we got him at Kano Airport, he was so nervous about coming to Nigeria, and uh, then he got in the airport and he felt pretty brave, and he said, oh, any damn fool could have done that. <laughs> We told him all you have to do is read the signs or ask somebody. So anyway, we went way in the northeast of Nigeria and really in this outpost place uh, where these duck-billed women. And they cut their lips like this when they're little and they keep putting bigger and bigger plates or in there until they look like this. And they, they must have heard about Eve because all they wore was a little couple little uh, leaves in front of them. And uh, the men did all the talking. And they said, well, you know, you owe each one of those women $50. And we said, what? We're not paying them $50. And they said, well, there was this American here, and he paid them all $50. And I said, well, who was it? Well, he said his name was Billy Graham. <laughs> and I said, well, he's got a lot of money. We're not paying that. <laughs> so uh, this is a very interesting thing because then on the plateau there, we went to what they called a tin mine. And there was Osiris Uri at the top of that machine. And it was all Osiris Uri. And uh, we were bragging to everybody that made in our town, that made in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And then a very interesting thing happened because when we went to that East Castle trip to Osiris Erie Museum, uh, we were looking at all that, you know, all that they had in there, all the machines and everything. And I saw that one post there and it was places Osiris Erie went around the world. So I pushed on Nigeria and this museum man came right over and he said, would you like to know what they mine there? And I said, yeah, I would. I said, I've been there, so I think I know. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> he said, well, it's gold and silver. So that really, I said to him, they said it was tin. And uh, I don't know how they look different or what, but anyway, I went home and got into the internet and started looking. And it said, what happened to our map? Oh, well. Um, uh, I looked it up, and they said there was a tin uh, mine there, but it wasn't uh, any big amount, but it was maybe fifths in, I can't remember if it was West Africa or the world or whatever. 
So then I looked up the gold and silver, and that was a way uh, near here, but not real close. And uh, they do mine some gold and silver, but that isn't a large amount either. Now, I want to tell you about the winter season. So we are in the winter of 1966 here. And there's something they call the Harmattan winds. And when they would blow, it would be cold. Now, the coldest it was in our house was 72 degrees on Christmas Day. And that was, but they thought that was very cold. And it even felt cool to us. And um, these Harmattan winds came come from way up in Siberia, in Russia. And they come down through the uh, Eastern uh, European countries and then across the Sahara. And they blow all this sand and dirt germs and everything, and, and the people um, really didn't know how to protect themselves from it really well, especially the babies. And so they told us that 50% of the babies died before they were two years old. Now that was in the 60s. I hope it's better than that now. Um, now this is our Earl's, I think I might have mentioned it before, Earl's favorite beggar. And he was, a, uh, he, he had uh, leprosy and his nose was missing. You can't really see it on the slide, but his nose is missing and all the tips of his fingers. And uh, he would run, you can see there, he's carrying his food bowl with him. And he'd run to get the money and of course that really is what fed him. And so he, they became, you know, talk to each other from the Earl and the Baker. But our driver at this time was a new driver and he happened to be Muslim. And he would always throw out two pennies or so to the beggars that he saw. And I said, why do you do this? You don't make that much money that you have been giving your money away. And he said, well, he said, to me, a beggar is the one who gets me in heaven. He said, I give him some money, and uh, Allah sees this, and he gives me, gets me into heaven, or gives me a higher place in heaven. And I thought about that, and I thought, boy, that is really a lesson to learn. Um, now, the Jebba Bridge was a bridge that we had to cross over any time we went south, really south of Vida. And the Jebba Bridge, you can see it there. I'm not sure that's exact. I guess it is the one. But the railroad went over the bridge and so did the cars and trucks. Oh, come on up. You're wearing the hat. You're wearing the hat a little different. Am I doing it right? Your head's too big. You have to walk real straight, otherwise it falls off. This is Earl's uh, cast on, and you can see it's all embroidered there. They did that with a pedal singer sewing machine, believe it or not. And the bottom of the, you put the pants on? The bottom of the pants are also decorated with the, and around the sleeves <laughs> and everything. <laughs> Isn't he a good sport? Yes. 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 The only reason I agreed to do this is because now I can put model on my resume. So <laughs> this is the only way it was ever going to happen. Yeah, just be there for a minute. I'm going to take your picture. Uh, I couldn't find anybody this size. This is one of our littlest daughter, Mary. This was her outfit, and I made it for her. And the boys had outfits too. And then it had this little blouse. And it's beautiful material. They have just beautiful material. I could never understand why it didn't come to this country. Uh, okay, the Jebba Bridge we were talking about. So when the railroad was coming through, we had to wait. And um, of course, the day that we were going to go uh, to the hospital, I 
got a quick roll. I never heard of a quick roll before, but I got a quick roll on my finger, and I they couldn't fix it at our hospital, so I had to go down to uh, Illorin, which is on the map here, I think somewhere. Uh, let's see, right there. What is a Wicklow? I don't know. It's an infection. Oh, an herpes. infection. Okay. Herpes. And uh, so anyway, I had to go down there to see the American uh, doctor, and um, of course the. the Railroad was just coming through the uh, car. And uh, Thomas, you know a little bit about him already. He was a little impatient, and so he pulled up uh, and went all the way around this whole, I bet it was a block long. And he just went around him and went up to the front and thought he was gonna get to be the first through. Well, by that time, the army had killed off enough of each other you know, they kept shooting each other. And um, uh, the army was not in very good shape anymore. And the guard there at the front was dead drunk. Mm -hmm. And his shirt was open, his pants were open. And uh, he lowered his gun right in Thomas's chest. Oh. And he said, I, I didn't. Thomas said, he said, back up. I mean, he wasn't talking in English. And he said, back up. Thomas started to argue with him. <laughs> and Earl flew into action and he said, back up. You know, and because if he would have shot Thomas, it was, we were sitting, the kids and I were sitting in the back seat. We would have probably got hit too. So anyway, he backed up. And um, that was good thing. Well, now this is the increase in the military presence since all of this uh, killing and murder and promotion went on. And here you can see the soldiers here. That's a typical roadblock that we'd have to go through. They were always polite to us. We never had to do anything but have them look through our car. Um, and one of our friends was carrying a train set, you know, a kid's train set that he'd gotten for Christmas or something. And the soldiers at the checkpoint here, well, not this one, but they were so excited to see that little train that they were playing with it and everything. And he said he had to go and they shut the trunk. And he went to the next place and they opened it up and there were three uh, machine guns in there. <laughs> so they had to try to talk themselves out of that. They did all right because they called back to the other one and they said, oh yeah, we, we lost our guns. <laughs> and then here's another site that we'd see once in a while, uh, soldiers driving around in an armored car or truck, whatever it is. Now one of the things I want to tell you about is the Falani. The Falani were one of my favorite tribes. They were very friendly. They dressed like this. You can see this man's hair is braided, and then he has two, two safety pins to hold it in place around his ear. <laughs> uh, and um, they, they were very good uh, with knives, you know, with short knives. And that's why they were considered the best uh, watchmen, because they wouldn't hesitate to do anything. Uh, many of them lived in the Sahara Desert. They went in and out of the Sahara Desert. In other words, they were nomads. And um, they dressed very colorful. And look at the girl, all the things that she had done. Now, one of the things they had to do when they were boys, when they were 16 years old, they had to go through the Sharo. I did not go because it was against the law, but they did it anyway. And they'd come in town, and they'd go right to the main square, and um, the 16-year-olds would then, you can see they put a stick across their back, and then they put their arms over the top, so it made their back very taut. And then, and they were bare to the waist up, and then that, elder, more man, he was already, had gone through this, 
He's whacking three times. And of course, it split their skin right open. Some of them actually, every once in a while, would die from it. But they still kept it up. And if they, if they did lose, they lost their girlfriend, they lost their pride, they lost everything. So they didn't dare cry out. Now I told you that the government wanted peace. So the people were all on the, I mean the authorities were on the lookout for any kind of problem that took place. And Ali, you of course, I told you he was a scoundrel. He's our cook, and there he is in the wood kitchen, smiling. He didn't end up smiling. <laughs> and uh, he, one day, he brought this woman. She was so gorgeous, you just can't imagine how beautiful she was. She could have been a model in the United States or the world, anywhere. She was just, she looked like, uh, is it Naomi Campbell? That's what you told me before, yeah. Yeah. She was just gorgeous. And so anyway, his friend was married to her and he loaned her to Aliou. <laughs> and so, um, of course, this, they, the friend was so insulted that he said they were going to have a fight. And so they each gathered their sides and they were going to have this big brawl. And of course, it made a lot of noise. And, uh, and then some people that probably wanted, you know, a reward or something, uh, notified Mick Walters, the guy that stood on the, the uh, bridge and saved all the evilists. He was the county executive and the emir. And the emir sped there to try to stop this fight. And when he got there, he said, this is about a woman? <laughs> Throw him in jail. <laughs> then he found out that he was my cook. <laughs> and he said, to, asked Meg Walters, he said, go and see if it's all right, if she missed, if I can put her cook in jail. And I said, absolutely, teach him a lesson. <laughs> well, the second day we needed bread and all these other things cooked and everything. And I notified Meg, I said, get him back. <laughs> <laughs> so he let him out. But in order to get out, he had to go to Sharia court. Now you heard about the Sharia court with the camera. Uh, this is, uh, he was in the Sharia court and the judge listened. To, well, first of all, Earl went. I, I did, again, didn't. I wish I had. And he, the judge met him at the door and ushered him up to sit right next to him. And so he, he heard about what, what they had done uh, this fight and everything. So he said, well, the punishment is 13 pounds, which was about a little over $30 in those days. They were still on English currency or 13 years in prison. Even nice choice, huh? So Earl paid it and he said, okay, he's your slave for the rest of all the time that you live there. So uh, he came over and um, he prostrated himself right in front of him. It was very embarrassing. We told him to get up and um, I, we told him he's still going to get paid. Don't worry about that. And uh, so anyway, he had these wounds. He had one stab wound right here in his his forehead, and he had another deeper one right in his gut. And the, uh, ma uh, the Muslim doctor, who was from Pakistan, would not treat him because he said that was the worst sin he could commit. So guess who treated him? I got out the alcohol and everything that I brought with me and what I bought there, and I cleansed the wounds, not gently. I wanted to teach him a real lesson. Uh -oh. <laughs> and after I got him disinfected, then I got out my sewing kit and I, I you know, I cleansed, I, I sanitized or whatever. The big needle, darning needle, I figured I needed a big one. 
and, uh, and the thread. I can't remember if I used button thread or if I used scandal floss. I think it was button thread. And so I sewed him up. I had to sew him up here and sew him up here because it, it was really bad. And um, so that was his punishment. Oh. <laughs> and, and mine. And I didn't want to do it, doing it. And anyway, that picture, I was going to tell you about that. That picture, Michael is a very calm, you know, more soft spoken man, boy and man. He was kind of bullied by his older brother, Tom, who isn't at all soft spoken. And really, he was here a few, when was it again? Oh, in July. No, August. Maybe some of you saw him. Anyway, he's more uh, noisy. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, he had, all you wanted his picture taken. He was so proud when he saw that Michael had bought that out, that head outfit. So he wanted his picture ta taken with him and he paid the photographer to come and take it. Now, one of the other uh, 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 travel things that we did was we went to the Waza Game Park, which is in the Cameroons. And it's right about here. And so we had to go through my Duvery. Now you've all heard of my Duvery. That was where the 450 girls were kidnapped by the Boko Haram. The Boko Haram was nowhere in sight then. There was no such thing. But anyway, we went through my degree and some of the other teachers from Wisconsin were at my degree. And so we visited them somewhat and we had taken, uh, we had a different car. It was a van kind of like. And um, we took the picnic, uh, what do you call those things? Baskets. We put, not bottled water, we just put water in there up to the top and closed them. We took everything we could, every big utensil we could find and put water in it. We were warned to be sure to have a lot of water because we were going out into, you know, Zimbabwe, it was just plain desert, just south of the Sahara. And um, anyway, we, uh, we crossed over into the Cameroons and it wasn't that far when our driver was a special driver because he'd been there before. And our directions to get to Wasa was go along the dry creek bed for I forget how many miles. And then when you get to the big tree, cross over the creek bed and turn right. That was the only directions we had. So we found it, I mean the driver found it and um, he, um, this is when we got there, that's the kind of a thing we stayed in, one of those little huts. It was very clean and nice. And it had a cement floor and there was a uh, shower inside and everything. And they immediately took us out to see the animals. And it was so full of animals. We saw herds of giraffe running across mm -hmm. the, and, in the bush and lots of elephants. See, it was later in the day and they were all coming for water. And it was just marvelous, all the animals we saw, lions and everything. But that night when we went to bed, it was so noisy and the wind was blowing, so it was hot. And the kids kept begging for water. And we hardly slept because all the trumpets from the the elephants, they were just trumpeting and the lions were roaring and there was all these other sounds. And so it was just loud in there and we, and then the kids were so thirsty. So we just were drinking and drinking and we kept telling them they had to be careful. So the next morning they took us out on another animal hunt and we saw uh, big war hogs and all this kind of stuff. So it was really exciting, but the driver told us, he said, I think we're going to have to leave early. We were going to stay another day, but we left. And um, along the way, 
power started to heat, no more water for us. He said, we have to save it for the car because that's our escape. And so uh, we made it into, I was gonna show, show you more on the, on the that's okay. Um, it's actually spelled, uh, they're right next to each other, that one and then M-O-R-A. And we saw this big place there and we drove in and it was either a cotton gin or a rice gin. Now you say, how could they grow rice? Rice grows in water. Mm -hmm. Except that I looked this up on the internet and here there's several lakes around there. there there's, there's desert area, but there's lakes. Don't, don't ask me why. And uh, so I, they originally said it was uh, for rice, so that's why we put the picture of the rice there. And um, the, they were totally French. Now the Cameroons was uh, ruled by the French, and uh, they were a colony of the French. And so they spoke only French. And we drove in and we couldn't tell them how badly we were off, how dehydrated we were. And he said, parlez vous Francais? And of course, Mary was five and a half by that time. I said, oui, oui. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know a word. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, they, start, they took us into the room. Uh, they had a nice bar and a nice rest area there. And they opened these bottles of orange swash. That was something that you always did drink orange swash in West Africa. And they were in liter bottles. And he opened two of them and Mary grabbed one, uh, Michael grabbed the other one and he took guzzled it down. He understood what that meant. So he got all, all these drinks and everything and he had his wash up and he had his rest. They were just, couldn't have been nicer. So then we started out for my jewelry, back to my jewelry, and we stayed there a couple days, and all we did was drink soup. <laughs> and then another place I wanted to tell you about, this is very close to um, Abita, where we lived, not far. I mean, it was, I don't know, what do you think, 30, 40 or 50 miles? Maybe it, it was a two-hour drive, but on, their, on those roads. So yeah, they were all unbelievable roads. So Abuja, is now the capital of the country. They moved it from Lagos to Abuja. So we can't imagine what it looks like now. But anyway, this woman here, uh, that's where, why we went there. We went there to buy ceramics. And I didn't, uh, I didn't, we didn't bring any of them down. I gave them all to my kids. And we had some of hers. And the, year, the month that we came to Nigeria, uh, the peak, the British Peace Corps was helping them with their kiln and everything, and they noticed her great skill. Wadi Kual was her name. And uh, they sent her uh, ceramics. Now, the way to send ceramics is to buy a, uh, baskets and put them in baskets and then wrap them up with cloth, and you get them. Uh, we got them all the way home here. And anyway, she, um, her, they sent her uh, ceramics to London, and she took first place. Mm -hmm. And so then in August, they did the same thing, only they sent it to New York, and she took first place oh, again. Wow. Mm -hmm. So you know how good she was. And um, then near there was Guara Falls. And so when we went, we'd buy the ceramics, and then we go to Guara Falls for a picnic. And you can see the building here as Michael and I standing under that thatched roof building and the falls is right beyond it there. And we'd have a picnic there before we went back to Bita. And this is what it looked like in the rainy season. It was just a roar of water. I mean, just, it made so much noise and everything. I was actually disappointed with Niagara when I went there. <laughs> and this is really, and this is it in the dry season. You can hardly see a trickle. Sometimes in the spring, when the when spring was dry, it, when it started to rain a little bit, you'd see some trickles coming down. But it wasn't very much. But you can see in this picture 
in the dry season. You can see that building way back here in the background. Okay, the other thing we went to for a big ex excitement was the regatta. And it was on the River Niger, which is one of the biggest, it is, I think, the biggest from West Africa. And it goes all the way through uh, Nigeria. It also has crocodiles. Uh, so anyway, we wanted to go to that regatta. They said it was very nice. And so there we are. It, to go by road was a long, many hours. And so we thought, well, we'll trek across. And so uh, the people must have always done that because we'd go up to the river and they would pile in the boat and they'd take us across and then we'd go to the next one and they'd take us across. And it didn't take us any time at all. And you can see again, Michael, he must be a brother of Thomas or something. Michael and me, and then our porter, who was carrying one of these big uh, picnic baskets. And uh, this is, I had, I have tons of these pictures, uh, slides left. And you can see all the people, and we thought the one with Coca-Cola sign was really great. <laughs> and there were uh, boats there that seemed to be more just decoration. And they'd go by, and then the racing boats that go by. And the Emir was actually there too. We had a picture of him, but I don't think he shows that one. But it was very colorful and a lot of excitement and everything going on. So it was well worth the trip. Now, I thought in this next part, I would show you just a lot of slides. We took thousands of slides. We don't have that many left in all this 56 or 60 years, whatever it is. A lot of them just didn't, didn't make it. But anyway, this was the meat market. And when Grandpa saw that, he said, I'm not eating any of that meat. And I said, well, it's salami beef. And Aliu picks it up first thing in the morning, so it's just been slaughtered. And we cook it a lot. It's very tough, and you can't eat it unless you add some acid and cook it a lot. Acid, you know, vinegar, lemon juice or something. And so that was one scene I wanted to show you. And then this girl, she put things under her skin here to make that decoration. And she must have thought it looked great. Uh, here's the women sellers there at our house. I think that's you, Lee. Me and Mike. Tom was always off chasing snakes and stuff. So he isn't in a lot of these pictures. He's right there in the green shirt. But these uh, women came, they were probably carrying bread or something, and they came to our house. And then here we are at the filling station, Mike and Tom. And then these are the girls with the calabash on their head. Uh, if you, you see those are round, real round on the end. What they do is they take straw or something or vines and they wind it around in a circle, uh, in a ring. And then they put that on their head and then they can balance those rounded bottoms very easily. And they were probably carrying milk. That's usually what they did. And they have very beautiful hand done embroidered blouses. And um, and woven, hand woven cotton. And, and here's some girls that are just having a good time. I thought they were pretty cute. Uh, then here's the leather goods. Uh, you know, they. I don't know if they make these anymore. It's probably a shame if they don't. And here's the men doing the needlework on the hats, like the one that Scott had on. Uh, the men do all of that kind of work. The women hardly do. They can do all the hard work. And here's a decorative calabash. Uh, things like this I would put up on bare light bulbs for uh, lampshades. And of course they decorated them up. I don't know if they do this anymore either. Uh, here I am holding a pot and that's me with me and one of the other wives of one of the teachers from Wisconsin. 
And that pot, believe it or not, I just gave away when I moved in October. It's in my house. It's in your house? Yeah, yeah no, good. It's sitting on Good. Uh, so then, um, here's a woman just, you know, selling more pottery. They had all kinds of different pottery for sale. And here's the weaver, a man, and they wove beautiful things like this. Gorgeous. And we, we asked them to make them and leave a place between, and then we cut them up for uh, place, replacements. And this is another one. I wanted to keep some that weren't cut. You can come up later and see them. Um, and then this is about Jimmy Jimmy Cheap Cheap. <laughs> now, Jimmy Jimmy used to go all the way to east to Kenya or somewhere, and then he'd come back across Africa, and he'd bring all these things for us to buy, and then he'd always lay out the cloth on the ground, and he'd always, and it'd be real cheap. And so we all, everybody started calling him Jimmy Jimmy Cheap Cheap, because he always said that, and he always said too, it'd be real era. <laughs> so we got it, and it was probably made out of toothpaste tubes. <laughs> so we had a lot of fun with him, and he, he brought a lot of nice things. And then this is a picture of all musical instruments. These type here, I had some of them, right? One of them. Did you get some? It's in Daniel's room. Oh, okay. the one right on the bottom. Okay, I had more than one. And what they do is they put those this way and squeeze them tight and then they hit them. And they can make them, they call them talking drums. And then um, there's different drums there. I also had a house of piano that was about this big and it had strings pulled across and you could actually play a little music on it. And we had some flutes and horns and stuff. I don't know where all that went. I gave away a lot of it. The kids chose a lot and the grandkids. And I sent some to museums. Okay, this is something that we named. The women, instead of hauling water and washing their clothes, they'd wash it in the stream. I thought that was pretty smart. And then they wrung it out and they brought it up and they laid, just laid it out to dry. So we call that the laundromat and this the dry. And the thing dried, you know, in minutes. It was so hot. And besides, they laid it on the ground and that was hotter. So it went, worked very well. Now these are women carrying robes on their heads. And this woman happens to be carrying a baby too. You can see the baby here, hanging there. Now, Nigeria has more twins than any country on earth. I don't think she has twins. Uh, but uh, anyway, they're carrying the things and they're carrying it on their heads. Now, my grandson told me I couldn't say this, but I don't know what else to say. But these women, you can see, are of a different class and they're carrying those heavy loads on the back of their neck. Mm. And they were all deformed from that, but the women did the hard work. And you can just imagine what that load of wood, load, uh, how much that weighs. And these were the pagans. Now, Daniel told me I couldn't say pagan anymore. That's not proper, I had to look up what religion they, or what belief they had, but I didn't have time. And then here's Tom, Mike, and Mary. He was already at school, standing with the poinsettias, poinsettias. And the other flower that was so beautiful there was a bougainvillea, in every color. The most beautiful bougainvillea that I ever saw was in Kenya. And they were lined up along the whole wall and they had every single color. They were gorgeous. Now this is Halloween and uh, I sewed Mary's costume. Luckily I had my sewing machine with me. Uh, Tom's, I just took his football equipment and covered with ceramic, uh, with foil. 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 
And then he made the shield and he put the plume on it. So he looked really good. He covered some boots with oil. And then Michael was the sheriff. And the funny thing about Halloween, there were Scottish people there. And they told the kids ahead of time, they said, now you're not getting any treat unless you do it, something nice for us. So we taught the kids, you know, with other kids too, from the other family. We taught them all these Scottish tunes. So they sang all these tunes, and the Scots were so pleased. And here's Mary with her kittens. I know you've seen them before. But this is her big kittens, the mother kittens, and the baby kittens, which were born on her bed. <laughs> so she learned a little bit about earth. Yes, and yes. Um, we don't have, oh yeah, we have this little basket with this one here in this basket. But we in, uh, told the basket maker how to make a cat carrier. It was actually made out of one of those that they're made. So they, we, we still had this not long ago. Laura had this. Oh, Laura had it? Oh yeah, she has cats. <laughs> And you can see the flowers out in front. Mm -hmm. uh, and here's the kids with the monkey. Monkeys came through every once in a while, probably twice a year. I think they were going after the mangoes. That was one thing I forgot to tell you when we were in, well, when we were looking at it, the landscape in Bida. Was it one of Emir? I don't know which one he was, but he ordered that all the street be lined with mango trees. So the people had something to eat, always. And of course, the mangoes were delicious. And they were all mango trees. And I think that's probably when they became ripe, the monkeys came. Now here's the horse ride. That's Lee and Mary. And Mary has Asta. Remember I told you her babysitter was Asta? And it was really Esther. Uh, well, there's the guy with the horse, the one in the red, and he gave him rides on the horse. And I was just trying to show you some of the, we, I didn't find the picture, but they had a, they had a, what was that little thing called? That little, uh, I do not forget that name. It's a little tiny uh, manger, not manger, but deer. What was that name? Oh, they, they were, they call it biscuits or something like that, I think. And here we are at Christmas, and this is a different priest. This is Father Sheeran, who's also from Ireland, and he's holding the baby doll. He thought that was so unique. He wanted to hold the doll, and the kids don't look very happy because they didn't get much for Christmas because we just shipped one uh, gift for them for each holiday. <clears throat> <laughs> no, they do. And then here's Father Galuli again. You heard about him before. And he's the one that uh, uh, gave Michael his first communion. And then comes the Six Day War. What time is it? I'm going to just make it. <laughs> uh, which was June 5th through 10th of 1967. Or in other words, it was called the Arab Israeli War. Now, why am I bringing that up? We're in Nigeria, but Lee was in Beirut. And when the war broke out, correct me if I'm wrong, they brought in the Pan Am Air Airlines. That's what they did anywhere back then. Anywhere in the world, anywhere Americans were in danger, Pan Am flew in and flew them out. Well, they came in, they marched the kids out in the dark, right? They had to pack in the dark. She brought clothes home, everything was mixed up uh, because they packed in the dark. And um, they were evacuated. Earl looked it up, he was following it on his Phillips radio and he got BBC on that. And it said they shipped them all to Istanbul, Rome, and Athens. Well, they, she had been in Rome and Athens, so she knew that somewhat. And um, the uh, Kaduna consulate called us up to uh, Kaduna, and the consul talked to us, and he said, 
for a couple few days had gone by. They found a boy that was lived in more near Port Harcourt, and they found him right away. And um, they said that, um, no worries, they said, we'll find her, you know. And, uh, you know, six days went by, eight days went by. We were really fighting him at that time. He was such an arrogant fool. And he kept, uh, I said to him, if you don't find her soon, I'm going to go out and find her. And he said, oh, what could you do? I mean, that's the way he said it. What could you do? And I said, don't ever estimate a mother. <laughs> and so I went back to the office, Earl and I went back to the office, and this man that lived across the street was from Lebanon. We'd only known him a couple of weeks. And he came up, he was a businessman, almost all of them were. And he came up and he said, um, I feel so terrible. This happened in my country. I said, it's not your fault. I said, they're not finding her. And he said, yes, but if I could call my family and have them look. I said, she's not there anymore. Don't even bother. She's not there. And he said, well, I'm going to London tonight. And I said, oh, will you take a letter for me? And he said, yes, he would. So I went back to the office. And now I remember uh, two weeks had gone by. I went back to the office and I typed the letter. Uh, to President Lyndon B. Johnson. And he took it. And the only thing I can think that he did was he knew the importance of it. And he went to the US Embassy and he told him to put it in the pouch. And they did. On the 13th day, Johnson had the letter. And I believe he did read the letter. He put Nicholas Katzenbach, who was assistant to Robert Kennedy, in charge. And he said, find this girl. Because I described everything in there. And I pleaded with him as a father of two daughters. And, um, this man that had been coming into the hotel from the Athens uh, embassy uh, came up and said to her, what is your name? He'd been coming in every day to see her and didn't know her name. And uh, he said, uh, oh my heavens, I mean, you can tell more of it if you want to. And uh, he grabbed her and he took her to the embassy, of course, got her clothes and everything. And Washington, D.C. ordered her be, to be sent to my parents in La Crosse, Wisconsin. So they sent her to La Crosse, and the next day, the phone rang at 8 o'clock in the morning. My mother, I can just see her, picking the phone off the wall. She had a wall phone. And they said, the president wants to know if your daughter, granddaughter is safe. And we were so unbelievably surprised when we got home and everybody hated Johnson because we loved him. <laughs> uh, and I'll say that's it. Thank you for coming. If you have Wisconsin. I changed planes three times, and then what she didn't tell you is when they left Nigeria, we were planning to spend oh, I forgot that. the summer in Europe, so she called the headquarters when I got to uh, and said, Spain. send her back. I said, we're spending and the summer in Europe. So I got on a plane from La Crosse, Wisconsin to Madison. I spent the day in the NTEP headquarters. And I then- flew, I didn't know that. Yes, I then, they sent me from Madison to New York. I changed terminals. I was in eighth grade. I changed terminals by myself 
and flew to Barcelona. I have, I watch my neighbors now who don't let their eighth and ninth graders go to the local movie theater in our extremely safe suburb that has no crime by themselves. And I am just astounded. The kids get, we live two blocks from an elementary school and all of my neighbors drive their kids. And they're doing the same as in the And I just look at this and I'm like, wow, you know, you have to trust that your kids can be competent. Well, they obviously aren't. <laughs> well, because they're not giving me opportunity. But anyway, it was it was quite uh, it was quite the experience. Uh, and we were waiting for her in Barcelona, and the embassy, the consulate there was so nice to us. And they it was the Fourth of July, and they invited us to their party, and we went there by bus out in the country, and we had this beautiful picnic and everything. So they were competent. The one and I, I. Well, what happened, okay, I can tell this really quickly. What happened in Athens is that planes were coming in from all over the Middle East. There were thousands of Americans, and it was total pandemonium, and there was this huge hangar, and they were putting everybody in the hangar, and there was a desk about this, a little bigger than this, with two people, and the lines were okay and you know here i am and i see a man with a big sign that says ford foundation syria oh gosh and i went up and i said my father works for the ford foundation in nigeria i can't get home because of the war and well you didn't work for the ford foundation at that scenario you worked for usaid but i told him you worked for the ford foundation <laughs> And he said, come with me, come with our group. As it turned out, one of the girls who was in my dorm, who was on my floor, what her, she was, her dad worked for the Ford Foundation in Syria. So they got a whole uh, floor of a hotel and they, and I, I roomed with her. And then he ended up, I was in Athens for a week and they ended up calling my grandmother and asking her if she would take me. And she no, said, right. you can send her, but I'm not taking. No, she said, I'm not signing anything. I'm not signing anything, but I, I will take her. And that's the way I got to go back and spend the summer. <laughs> but that's well, my, my mother was pretty smart. Yeah, so anyway. It was, she knew how the government worked and she said, I'm not I'm not promising anything. I'm not signing anything. And then when I called up from uh, Barcelona, they had to send her there. Uh, yes? I'm confused 30? about why Lee was, she had to leave school or she had to? Because I had well, the, the war six, broke The six-day war. Yeah. That was in, between? I was in Beirut at boarding school. Oh, so you had to get out of Beirut. And the reason I was in Beirut is because, see, all the British boarding schools start taking kids at a very young age. But in American-oriented boarding schools started in ninth grade. So all over Europe, there were American boarding schools where, you know, like ambassadors' kids went and all of this kind of thing. And the only place that would had where I could go was Beirut because they started boarding in seventh grade. And most of the kids at my boarding school, I mean, there were some missionary kids, there were some, um, you know, embassy kids from all around the Middle East, but most of them, their fathers were engineers. In, no way. In, in Iran, mm -hmm. Iraq, and Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait. And so, plus my no, dad no. had a friend who was teaching at that school. So that's why, that's how I ended up going. Well, back. she was really a family friend. Right. I still my Christmas cards to her. Yeah. Uh, tell us about some of the graduates of your school. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's the American Community School. 
And I just actually was interested in, and I looked it up, and I was absolutely astounded by what some of my classmates, or the, you know, the people I knew um, had done. Um, was I one drummer for the Sting? Yes, one of them was the drummer for Sting, and I, and our little sock house. I mean, I was in the Sting as either. <laughs> and then um, I think, wasn't it John Cousy? Who was it? I don't know. Um, and actually, the, the Sting drummer guy, his father was the head of the CIA. Oh, oh geez. <laughs> they, I mean, of course, nobody knew that then. He was a businessman. <laughs> and um, a lot of people became, you know, that had high positions at the State Department and, you know, had been you know, very successful. Lee, do you have taught some of them from your experience? Uh, you know, I, I've i given many, many talks. I was a professor. Oh, I but I, I have not, uh, no, I actually, I've told people the story, but no, I've never given a talk about it. Oh, my gosh. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> you were the first people that really wanted to know about you. Oh. Oh, really? I'm curious what, what made you a professor at Sting? Uh, I, I was a developmental psychologist. Okay. And so, and I worked in a college of education. Uh -huh. um, what do we know in Illinois? And, and oh, to help. Sure, I'm from Illinois. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah. 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 And we lived in a far western suburb, and my husband worked in a city, and I went out. Uh -huh. Which was Geneva. I, oh, my nephew was the mayor of Geneva. Oh, oh, oh my God, Kevin! Oh, Kevin! Oh, Kevin! Oh, Kevin. Oh, Kevin. Oh, and my sister <laughs> Anne. Small <laughs> world. Yes. Yes. It's a small world. I don't. I've met her. Yeah. yeah. We are supporters of Kevin. Oh yeah, yeah. Fourth term. He's my godson. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Small yeah, world. Yeah, yeah. I had to ask. <laughs> Yeah, great. I think I did ask you that before. I think we were. It is a small world. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we brought a few things um, that for me brought them. Most of them. I this I happen to have this. This is a uh, ebony head. That's where I put that hat that <laughs> that Scott wore. Oh. <laughs> and um, if you want to look, yeah. Oh yeah, this is. A, Oh, and bead is specialized in brass and also glass beads. I, I don't have any of the beads, but some of the brass is here. Now, this is something they put on there. It's, it's a mirror fall. Well, it will. <laughs> mirror falls off. <laughs> well, it's, 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 been, it's kind of old. It's got a little beat up, but yeah. So anyway. Yeah, so then the, there's just cloth. I think I had, had one cloth there in the last year. And this is from Beat of Brass. And if you're ever at UWM, I put some furniture there that made uh, two, two small end tables and a, a coffee table, because I couldn't put it in any museum because the elephants that are holding up the top have ivory in their toes and in their tusks, and you cannot put any ivory in a U.S. museum. Oh. So they got it. Where is that UWA? It's a, a history section in the uh, African. African American. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. Cool. It's in the office there. Right. The chair came. We, I was at, at their at, at our house, uh, to their house and picked it up. Mm -hmm. right. When she moved here. Yeah. I mean, believe, getting rid of all this stuff was really a problem. Yeah. I mean, our kids and our grandkids took our basement. I wish I'd kept a couple of those purses. I had purple. Elizabeth and Grace took them all. Oh, good. My <laughs> grandchildren. They, one of them is made out of uh, leopard, and the other one is uh, elephant hide. No, crocodile hide. Crocodile. And then there's a python one. And then, oh, all right, it's python. <laughs> no, not, they can't, not python, the cobras. They don't have pi pythons there. Cobra. Oh, anyway. Snakes. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it was an adventure. <laughs> How long were you there? Two years. 
my husband was there just to, he said he'd leave because he was the last one there. The rest of their two years was up earlier. So he said he'd stay till the war started. And the war started and he got in the car and drove to Kano and took off. <laughs> so that was it. Yeah, well, I understand that. <laughs> Oh, really interesting. Thank you. 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 Thank you.